men, gentle people uh, of all ages, men and women and others, you're all welcome here because today we're talking about women. Bro, I love talking about women because first of all, I have more respect for women than anyone I know. Second of all, because uh, I like getting canceled. It's become a weird sex thing at this point. I, I don't know if it's like coming from a sexual place, but like I, I, it kind of makes me make me excited. So today we're talking about women. Ladies and gentlemen, um, my boy, Master Samwise, who makes great videos, uh, made a video, The Failed Femininity of Netflix's Katara. And I completely agree with this. Holy moly. I completely agree with this, like a bajillion percent. So as someone that loves women, first couple times, oh man, it sucks. And then it's like, oh, free publicity. <laughs> God damn it. Well, anyway, so today we're talking about women, specifically when it comes to Netflix's Avatar. I'm really happy this is the topic that we're going to be covering because specifically Netflix's Avatar, I think, was a uh, it was a massive failure. Not that it per se was the worst show I've ever seen. It was just a solid four out of ten, and which is the worst rating. When I watch something, I want it to either be a nine out of ten or a one out of ten. I want it to either be great or I want it to be like absolute dog shit. When it's just a four out of ten and it's adapting something that's a nine out of ten, that is literally the worst possible outcome. The worst possible outcome. Um, so one thing that I think Avatar did so well, the original cartoon, is their female characters. I, I have never seen female characters just written so well like in Avatar. I think that Katara, Toph, Azula, like the actual female all-star cast was literally perfect. And the fact that Netflix came around and was like, we're going to fix the sexist parts of Avatar. And they made Sokka less sexist. And they tried to make Katara more badass and, and awesome and just... My guys, my homies, they ruined women. Let's see what Master Samwise has to say. Last year, some idiot made a video titled Toth and Katara, Strong Female Characters Done Right. Which, by the way, <laughs> I think he uploaded at the same time as I was doing my videos on uh, as Strong Female Characters Done Right. Like, this is like a, a video topic that I do a lot as well. In this atrocious video essay, he posited that the female leads of Avatar The Last Airbender are two shining examples of how to display femininity through two drastically different yet wonderfully and lovingly crafted feet! Sorry, sorry. Did characters. This moron believed that their compassion, caring, patience, persistence, passion, and hopefulness, not simply their ability to throw natural elements at bad guys, was what made them much needed paradigms of powerful feminine virtue in the modern world of entertainment. Well, yeah. the Netflix came along too. Sh yeah, yeah. I, I think that one thing that I really hate about the the weird, like almost dystopian modern look at gender roles and gender tropes is the fact that they're trying to make believe that women aren't allowed to be feminine and men aren't allowed to be masculine. I think that's that's very cancelable take, guys. But see, I believe that a really hot Nuxanor take. Get ready, get ready for my steaming load to drop all over your face. I think that what feminism should be is giving women the opportunity to do whatever the hell they want, including be feminine. Somehow, being feminine is against feminism today? Like, I'm I'm sorry, I'm just confused. I'm confused that this is how the world turned and what happened in the world, which is why I'm covering it in this way. Acceptable! Women being feminine, question mark. I think women have the right to do whatever the hell they want, just like I think men have the right to do whatever the hell they want. A man is allowed to not be masculine, and a woman is not is a, is allowed to not be feminine. But it doesn't be cringe if a woman decides to be feminine. <laughs> like I, I find that whole like weird topic so so utterly astounding. The the traits that make Katara and Toph strong are two completely separate sides of what makes people people, and what makes a strong badass female character a strong badass female character. Trying to remove all of that to just like be the epitome of badassery does not necessarily make your character feel more badass. It doesn't necessarily speak well of women around the world. Show that simpleton what a true strong woman should be like. Yeah, dude, like what, what's so beautiful is the fact that like you have a character like Katara, okay? Katara uh, is not my favorite character in Avatar. Let me just preface by saying that. But she was really strong. Like, she was an incredibly badass character throughout the entire show. She ended up becoming basically the best waterbender alive, right? Her bloodbending was insane. Like, she was a really powerful character, but one of her major character flaws that she had to work on, because newsflash, every character needs flaws, is the fact that she was overly compassionate in certain ways. Like, uh, I, what comes to mind is there was that one episode about the, the water spirit. 
and um, it was basically her dressing up as a water spirit to go help a poor Fire Nation town that was, uh, like, it was so tragic or whatever that the town was being abused by a giant juggernaut fire bending complex, the Painted Lady episode, and she went to help them. And another one is, like, the Jet episode. The fact that she, you know, she had a crush on Jet and she wasn't willing to see the fact that he was, he was a terrorist. They weren't willing to see the fact that Jet was a terrorist and because she wanted to believe him, because she had a little crush on him. Like, the fact that she had compassion did not make her a weak character. It made her a much stronger character in the long run. The fact that she would work past those parts of herself and become a real badass character is really dope. It's really appreciated. Compassion did not make her a weaker character. Toph, okay, I don't even know where to start with Toph. Toph, okay, we'll, we'll cover Toph later because I made a whole video about Toph specifically. But compassion is not cringe. And the fact that Netflix decided to be like, oh, well, she's going to be compassionate to Aang because he's a good guy, but she's not going to really have any feminine qualities in any other ways because we're past that. All right, that's enough of the sarcasm shtick. I can't have that be my whole identity. It truly is remarkable how Hollywood manages to mangle female characters time and time again. Yeah. Oh, they get wild. it at least somewhat right every once in a while. Most recently, Mizu from Blue Eyed Samurai just. Dude! Dude! Peak! Peak! Despite her incredible power, is actually done quite well. Peak. Literal peak. Mizu from Blue Eyed Samurai. I was thinking of making a whole uh, female characters done right video on Mizu. Literal awesome character rating. But the majority of major releases featuring a woman of some skill or ability can- it, Their entire character gets boiled down to their skill and ability, never to their actual weaknesses. Continue to go down the same route, writing characters whose central arc is that of self-actualization, whose struggles are dwarfed by their natural talent, and who can win the day by just being themselves and not holding back. What's in Yeah, that that trope is so damning and so hurtful. Imagine being imagine being a woman. If women were real, this would be like obviously much harder hitting. But imagine being a woman, okay? You're sitting back, you're watching something, and you're you're not actually a badass. You're not Mulan or Captain Marvel, okay? And and you know, you're not actually the greatest person of all time. In fact, you're just average. Uh, and then you watch the show and it's like, oh, just be yourself and you can do anything. When no. In fact, that is not true. In fact, you have to work really freaking hard to get anywhere in life. That is how the world works. If you don't put the work in, if you're not gonna sweat to get to any heights, my homie, you're not gonna get there. It doesn't matter who you are. It's like actually bad life lessons. Incredibly depressing about many of these stories is not just that they follow the same- Put a woman in it, make her lame and gay. In main blue. As a woman, I'm not real. Thank you, Chad but also that they managed to mangle the unique, carefully constructed arc of the original character. Yeah, dude, Mulan was so great because she wasn't super skilled before she trained. But her training, in the original Mulan, her training was so arduous and difficult that she actually became a badass later on in the story. Like, in the Mulan new movie, they decided that, you know what, we're just going to make her badass from the get-go. When she was a child, she was badass, and it was just the patriarchy that prevented her from uh, following her dreams as a woman. In the original Mulan, she didn't want to be a soldier. She became a soldier to help her dying father because they were going to take him instead. So she decided to make believe she was a man to fight for that. Not because she was a badass fighter, but because she did it to protect someone through love and compassion and caring, and her hard work made her a good fighter. In the new Mulan movie that they made, like, she was always a badass. She always should have been in the military, but they didn't want her because she was a woman. Like, that's a whole different ass story. And make her worse in every possible way. Call me impossibly optimistic, but I was beginning to think that maybe we were growing out of this phase. That the industry realized that these sorts of character arcs are wildly unpopular with audiences. That they suck! They're not wildly unpopular. They are objectively terrible. They're bad from a moral lesson perspective, and they're also bad from a writing perspective. The writers had finally decided to inject some life into the dull... God, Arcane was so good. ...wooden, self-fulfilling girl bosses that plagued the late 2010s. If any show were to break that mold... It would be Avatar! A show that literally solved the problems before they were even brought up. The original Avatar was perfect. Dude, this is why you can't adapt shit like that and, and try to oh my god it was it was a nightmare i i meant i messaged matt owens the uh the producer of the live action one piece right after i watched uh, the live action avatar and i was like yo dude can i just remind you of how good of a job you did with one piece i just watched avatar 
Surely it would be the adaptation of the masterpiece that is Avatar The Last Airbender. Surely Netflix would see the brilliance of the original and maintain the depth of its characters who form the very heart of that little story. Dude, the top, the, the top scene where she felt beautiful, like that was such a like heartwarming scene. Yeah. Well, it- Women don't need to feel beautiful. Women need to be badasses. Didn't. Now, Katara is hardly the only character to which Netflix did a grave disservice. Almost every- Uh, yeah. They did a grave disservice to every single character. Literally all of them. Except for Monk Gyatso, because he was only around for like 30 seconds. Every character in the adaptation acts like they're doing a half-hearted job of trying to keep Ko from stealing their face. And even those actors who manage to rise above the incredibly mediocre script have their characters severely downgraded from their original form. Yeah, I think as far as acting-wise, again, I don't. This isn't me hating on the actors. I think that um, like uh, Zuko's actor, um, I think that uh, Sokka's actor was pretty great too. I just felt like the script was ass. Like, dude, the fact that the <laughs> they really literally removed every possible. There, there's no point to Sokka anymore. They don't need him anymore. He's literally useless now. My God. But someone had to be first on the chopping block, and since I'm a chivalrous sort of fellow, I say- Sock on these nuts! All right, chat. Nice, hilarious. Babies first, and so we begin with Katara. Or, that is, the simulacrum of Katara that completely misses the mark set by her animated counterpart. M my favorite part about this Katara is the fact that she uh, was absolute dog shit at waterbending, and then uh, Aang said to her, but have you considered being at one with everything and nothing at the same time? And then she was like a waterbending master ASAP. The first hint that 2024 Katara would lack some key character elements comes at the very beginning with the opening voiceover, which lacks- Which is not good. They made Kiyoshi do the opening voiceover. It's the iconic line, but I believe Aang can save the world and doesn't actually seem to be given by Katara at all. And yet it turns out Katara has just like no faith in Aang, the, the strong male character. Yes, I know that the opening monologue in the first episode of the original doesn't have that line, but it expresses the same sentiment of hope that is absolutely crucial to Katara as a character. <laughs> hope? Hope is for, for, for women of the Dark Ages. Only 1940 women have hope. Us modern day badass women, we have confidence. Despite that, the first new episode does give us the sense that it understands the importance of Katara's relentless hopefulness. As she tells Sokka, that's what the Avatar is. He's hope, and people need that just as much as they do food and shelter. This unyielding belief that you can make a difference, no matter the odds, if you simply try to help people in need, is what makes Katara Katara. It enables her to be the beating heart of Team Avatar, yeah, to bro. be the glue that holds See, them like, together. She's such an important character, and her hope and love and compassion is so important. I, I feel like the uh, the bastardization of female characters just to make them more badass is doing it women a bigger disservice than just making well-written female characters her compassion and hope and love are qualities of her character that that had that really helped the original avatar so so much they're not weaknesses god damn it bro together when they're on the brink of collapse so it was encouraging to hear her express this sentiment so early on problem, however, is that it almost never comes up again in the following six plus hours of runtime. The only other time we get any sort of speech about hope comes in the Spirit World episode, where Netflix simply copies and pastes Katara's original line about new life coming out of death. Beyond that, the overly emotional Katara who can't help but make weepy speeches about hope just isn't there. Well, uh, weepy speeches, that's for weak women, bro. Katara is a strong woman. Bro, dude, you are literally killing women here. <laughs> it's so sad. It's so sad. The conceit of these people thinking that female characters need improvement to begin with. Some female characters are shit and do need improvement. Katara was not one of those. Katara is allowed to be a emotional character that's compassionate and hoping for a brighter future. And these things are not negative qualities that need to be destroyed. These are, God, let me be my weepy, hope-filled woman self. God damn it. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, chat. Thank you, chat. A fact which highlights the real issue with Netflix's Katara, which demonstrates why she is a failure of femininity, she just isn't much of anything. Low-resolution Katara doesn't just fail in her femininity because she's not as motherly, or because her romantic relationship with Aang is nuked from orbit, or because she doesn't mend Sokka's pants. After all, femininity cannot be constrained to a certain set of behaviors or practices, it is simply True. about living virtuously as a woman. 
So we must ask the question then. Damn, man, spitting Master Samwise out here, spitting factos. See, it's it's wild to me that uh, that modern, the modern concept of female characters is just taking away as many previously tropey female traits as possible. That's really what it felt like they were doing. Is carbon copy Katara virtuous? Well, no, not really. That's not to say that she's a bad person, or that she's swimming in vices, she's a modern heroine, of course she isn't, but rather that the virtues of compassion, affection- yeah, that, That's what I'm saying. The original Katara that saw the Fire Nation village suffering because of pollution that went out of her way to protect them, like, that that believed in Jet, even though Jet was a terrorist, you know? Like, those traits that she had were really wholesome and beautiful and part of her character writing. And uh, while I personally am a you know, a cynical bitch, and I wouldn't help that Fire Nation village. That's not the point, because everyone's different. And turning characters that had very well-rounded character traits into someone that's not that because you want to promote a message of what women should be is weird. Trust, ardor, and of course hope, which defined Katara, simply are not present. They are stripped away almost completely leaving imitation Katara hollow, shallow, and lacking meaningful character work. Her failure as a character, as a woman, is not so much defined by what Netflix did with her arc, as it is by what- God, my favorite thing is watching men talking about how to not write women. Yes, you're so right, King. <laughs> God damn it. They didn't do. Uh... Katara's relationship with Aang reduced to the level of buddies who do stuff together. No! She... No! Reduced to buddies! No! He's not the one to pull him out of the Avatar state at the Southern Air Temple. Sokka accompanies her through the Cave of Two Lovers. Yeah, that's in the first season now. Bro, secret tunnel! Secret tunnel! Through the mountain! Secret tunnel! I, I love that original episode. I know that people hated that, but yes, they put the sibling in the Cave of Two Lovers. Yes, put the siblings there. Yes! Yes! There's simply nothing beyond them just kind of hanging out and going on their trip together. All the fun interpersonal dialogue that takes place in the original. Well, I don't think no that's a Katara problem. I think that's an entire Avatar uh, adaptation problem. The biggest issue with the Avatar adaptation is the fact that they tried to turn this story into Game of Thrones, okay? They, they tried to make it like a dark, gritty, political story, when in actuality, we're following children through an adventure, and it just doesn't work. Nowhere to be found here. The show just assumes that because they're doing things together, they care about each other in some vague, friend-like way. Remember how Katara gave an incredibly idealistic and overly optimistic speech yeah, in prison? Yeah, to that prison of earthbenders. Oh, man. And it was cringe. When she drove, went in there and let herself get captured to save some earthbenders, that was so cringe and idealistic. But that was who Katara is. Earthbenders, sure that her words would drive them to fight for their freedom. And, and they did it. She gives a whole speech. Guys, fight for yourself. You are proud. You are earthbenders. And then the earthbenders are like, in the background, bro, that scene was fire in the original. Like, they did not share that same hope for a future that she did. And then, when that failed, had to temper her relentless sense of hope with some realism and practicality in order to make things work out? Yeah. It's almost like flaws are not a bad thing in a character. That's just not here. You know how Katara became totally smitten with and completely trusted Jet, this suave, dashing freedom fighter who is as good with, with people as he is with his swords, and how the discovery that he was, in fact, quite the monster broke her! It broke her! Deeply disturbed her? Disturbed her? She was like, it, it shattered her trust. How the betrayal of her trust left a lasting wound because of her great capacity to care and love? Nah, now she just finds out he's a terrorist, snarks him a little bit, and goes on her merry way without him. Dude, that's so fucked up. That's literally so fucked up. It's like, oh yeah, because, uh, dude, saying that, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, regressive to say that women actually could be tricked, or betrayed, or trust someone, and then that person end up being a duplicitous bitch. Nope. Nope, can't be, can't be, uh, she, she's a badass, and, uh, she was, uh, she was betrayed, and she was like, ah. Uh, well, fuck that guy. And moved on, put sunglasses on, and had an explosion behind her. Got a second thought. So, what does that leave us? What remnant of Katara's personality is there left to work with? She's a waterbender, and she's strong. Wow, it's almost like Netflix is literally doing the same thing that every other fucking show is doing. Well, pretty much one thing and one thing only. Her bending. Xerox Katara's she's entire strong. character arc is just her learning how to be a master waterbender. 
literally, not just. it's all about the power. It's crazy that this is this is what every single character arc devolves to. It's not truth is it's male characters too, but I think it's much more female characters these days when it comes to Hollywood Hollywood type productions. The character arc for everyone is becoming a badass. God damn it! It's that she has to be a fighter. Of course, the original handles this subject as well, but we'll get to that comparison later. Right from the start, Clone Katara proudly proclaims to Aang, I'm a warrior. This is despite- yeah, that, that's literally her first thing. And then uh, Sokka tells her, uh, go hide in the tent. And she's like, oh, sure. The fact that she literally just told Sokka, not everything is about preparing to fight. Ah, I didn't even notice that. Not everything is about preparing to fight. I am a warrior. But that was for his character arc, not hers. So there's obviously no need for her to be consistent. Damn. And oh, you best believe we'll be talking about how they massacred my boy Sokka. But oh, dude, it. the Sokka downfall was was awful. Was awful. That's not like a masculine feminine thing. That's just like they literally killed this man. See, I think that Sokka being a sexist and learning to respect how women could be badasses is such a cool character arc, right? In the beginning, Sokka was like, no, men need to fight. Men are the fighters and all that, right? And he learns through his sister, Katara, being awesome, through the Kiyoshi warriors being awesome, through Toph, through Azula, that, oh, turns out women are, are fucking awesome, badasses. And he goes through this insane character development of self-discovery and, and appreciating shit. He is such a manly character in the original because, well, and he understands what being manly is about. It's not about putting yourself above women. Being manly is finding value and, and uh, accomplishment in your actions, being there for people and stuff. Like, dude, that character arc cannot exist here. Oh, God damn it. I think Sokka for sure got the shortest end of the stick of every single character in the series. I think Iroh also, to some extent, but dude, Sokka. Like, dude, this guy was, he was pivotal for the story and they annihilated him. Heading back to Temu Katara, who is now arguing with Sokka about dude, whether- Dude, does he have a different, a different description for Netflix Katara every time? Temu Katara, Clone Katara, Xerox Katara, every time he's just gonna call her Skinwalker Katara here. Not they should go with Aang or return to the Southern Water Tribe. I refuse to call it Wolf Cove. Her argument that they need to help the Avatar save the world doesn't sway her older brother, but you know what does? Her declaration that it's about more than just helping Aang. That is to say, it's about her. Before Aang showed up, she couldn't bend wow. with the bar. But now, thanks to the energy that he gave her, she can do all sorts of water bending. I can't go back. Selfish. Selfish! What? That's crazy! I didn't finish the whole Netflix live action, obviously. But, bro! Is her definitive statement. Her definitive statement is the selfishness about her wanting to become stronger. That's crazy. Katara was the most selfless character in the original Avatar. She was so selfless. So selfless. Dude, helping a Fire Nation village for their sake, even though they're literally at war with the Fire Nation. That is pure selflessness. <laughs> Look how they massacred my show. And that is how she wins the argument. That is why Sokka accompanies her on this journey. For her sake. Well, fuck Sokka's character arc. <laughs> what? Not my Sokka. Not my Sokka. Because Wish.com Katara needs to be able to waterbend. Naturally, Katara learning to waterbend is a significant part of her character in book one. Yeah, because she needs to, you know, get... Because she is a badass, strong character. See, that's the thing. Oh, God, it's so frustrating. Katara is a great female character because not only is she compassionate and caring and hopeful and kind and all those, that feminine bullshit, but she's also super badass. She's also so strong. She beats Azula in a glorified one-on-one -on -one at the end of the series. She is so powerful. She bloodbends, bro. However, learning a skill is not the most interesting character work. It's not character work. Unless it, you know, it's, it could be tied with character work, but it is not character work. Becoming powerful is so not writing a character's personality. How they learn that skill is far more compelling. Yeah. The challenges that characters have to overcome and the sacrifices they have to make are the key elements of such a journey. Such struggles were how Katara displayed her growth in virtuous femininity as she fought through her self-doubt and learned to temper her wildly optimistic expectations with practicality. Remember how yeah. Aang was a naturally talented waterbender while Katara struggled to get the form correctly? Well, I'm, I'm really happy he's mentioning this because I like this too. It's the fact that Katara stuck at waterbending and kept working so hard that Katara ended up far, far surpassing Aang as a waterbender. Uh, even though Aang had much more natural waterbending uh, talent and what, or whatever, Katara ended up becoming much better because she was so much more dedicated at waterbending than Aang was. Remember how that deeply frustrated her? 
and remember how she then surpassed Aang in skill because she refused to let that frustration yeah. stand in her way yeah. and worked far harder yeah. than her airheaded counterpart. It's hard to forget, assuming you've seen the original yeah. show, it's a pretty crucial character point for both Katara and Aang. Well, to nobody's surprise, it's gone here. Netflix took that scene and then just gave impressionist Katara the natural talent. Aang even tells her as much. You're a natural, he says. You're a real waterbender, Katara. Blah. Blah. Dude, but taking a female character, or any character, taking any character that's not strong and having them go through uh, development where they end up becoming strong at the end, the goal is not becoming strong. The goal is the journey to become strong. The reason why we support Naruto through his, his fucking adventure is not because he ends up strong enough to beat pain. It's because we saw how much he struggled to become strong enough to beat pain. Like, I, I don't, it's mind blowing to me that this, this gets forgotten. God, it's so frustrating. I'm like, it's so nerve wrackingly frustrating that people think this is a good direction to take fiction. Now, it's not necessarily a problem for someone to be naturally good at something or even fully self-taught to the level of mastery in that discipline. But if they are, and they don't really struggle as Katara is now not struggling, then there needs to be something else. There needs to be a struggle, bro. Every character needs to struggle. Which they struggle. There needs to be other character work happening. And for Clarence Isle Katara, there simply is nothing else going on. She's learning to bend. That's her entire character arc. And while becoming proficient at waterbending did really matter to Katara, yeah. her journey was given more flavor and depth by the presentation of Aang as naturally skillful, a fact True. that annoyed Katara. It True. Did what, I, what I really like about the original Avatar is they made it very clear that Aang is the most uh, naturally skilled at everything, but it's the fact that Katara worked so hard that she became a much better waterbender than Aang was. It's the fact that the top was blind and had to make her way through life tr doing everything and to evolve her earthbending that made her a much better earthbender than Aang was. Right? All that stuff, I think, was... That, that's really cool. That's really great character writing on both their points. ...did not prevent her from ultimately becoming his teacher. Why cut that out? It just takes away from both characters. Dude, the fact that... It's true, though. The fact that Aang was more skilled than Katara in episode 2 when it comes to waterbending, and then water Katara ended up working so hard that she became his waterbending master at the end of this season, the first season. Like, dude, that that's insane character development. That's writing a badass female character. Someone who, despite the odds, becomes stronger. And then Netflix is like, nah, let's make her always more talented. It gives facsimile Aang less maturity to gain as he Facsimile no Aang! Let's go! ...has to overcome the laziness associated with natural talent, and it makes knockoff Katara far less perseverant because she doesn't have that example of skill toward which she must work. However, it wouldn't be fair for me to say that she doesn't struggle at all with waterbending. When trying to figure out the water whip, mimic Katara can't quite get it right, and when Aang tells her to tap into her emotions, she flashes back to her mother dying and fails even more spectacularly. This comes up again when she's talking with Jet, who reveals that my mother was the fighter in my family because of course she was, and what does he mean by that? <laughs> yeah, in my family, the major fighter was a female. It's not relevant to the plot at all. Yeah, we added it to the story, but we just want you to know that it's important that, that women can be strong too. Like, like anyone who would watch the original Avatar would think women can't be strong. Like, are you fucking brain dead, bro? Are you brain dead, dude? You think anyone can watch Avatar and think women can't be strong? When Katara, Toph, and Azula are three of the five strongest characters in the whole story? D. Katara mentions how the thoughts of the night her mother died have been coming back to her, and I think it's been affecting my bending. Jet tells her that you have to use everything inside you to help you fight, and asks her to remember what Kaya was like before she died. Upon doing so, Erzat's Katara can now whip water with the best of them. That was easy! I can't focus because my mother's death was traumatic. Use that! Okay, <laughs> instantly uses that. On the face of it, this isn't bad. Finding healing by remembering how your deceased mother loved you, how she found joy in the sunrise and the little things of life makes some passable sense. The problem, once again, lies not so much in what this scene is, but rather in what it isn't. What did it mean for Katara to lose her mother? It meant that she, despite being younger, had to essentially become Sokka's mother, and to yeah. raise her older brother. That's, that's a really good point. In the original Avatar, lo losing her mother made her more womanly. It's not about making her a stronger fighter, per se. It made her need to take care of Sokka and the village. That, that's a really good point. That, that's what the death trauma actually did to her. By switching that to, oh, now it makes her water whip stronger. It's a rage inside her that helps her fight. Dog, you are, 
you are cucking this character wherever you can to get rid of any actual personality trait that could even be construed as feminine. That she had to take on duties within their home and their village far beyond those typical for her age. It forced her to mature far faster than normal. It caused her to lose much of the innocence and carefreeness inherent in childhood. Bro. It drove her to be protective and cautious even to a fault. In other words, it had a deep and lasting impact on Katara, shaping the very nature of her personality, motivations, and fears. But for kinda Katara, her mother's death is really only important because it relates to her bending. That's crazy. Honestly, that's that's humiliating. It, you see, it's hard to differentiate the canons of these shows. I'm never finishing this show, by the way. But it's really hard to differentiate these canons because I know what Katara's mother's death did for her character in Avatar, like the actual Avatar. But over here in half-baked Avatar, like, that sucks. It's like... All the world building in, in the Netflix Avatar is just, they're trying to world build an already built world. So obviously my my impression of the world is gonna be biased by the impression I have of the world building in the original Avatar, which was great. Because her bending and her desire to be a warrior bender is the only significant consistent character trait present in this poor imitation of our favorite loopy haired heroine. That's awful. That's so sad. In the first episode. Like all the, all the scenes in the original Avatar where Katara would be blushing and be all offended or whatever, being upset that she's like you know treated badly because she's a woman or or whatever or being looked down at like those scenes do more for you know feminism or women than just making her strong for the sake of it so does mention she tells ang i'm a warrior despite having no training or actual waterbending ability at that point in the second episode she reads grandma exposition scroll which tells her you are a waterbender that's who you have always been in the third episode, Jet God tells her, it. I had a feeling you knew how to handle yourself, because- Oh God, stop it! Every episode has more of this girl boss and bullshit. Prowess is absolutely the first thing that comes to you when looking at this small child. In the fourth episode, Katara discovers Jet's terrorist ways and confronts him and then freezes him, causing him to say, Look at the power you have. That's because of me. But oh no, we can't have that be true. Katara must be self-made. That wasn't you. That was me. <laughs> Every line. Every line. Dude, she's just the new Captain Marvel. She is literally a new Captain Marvel. This is insanity. Even though she later tells Sokka, Jet, he helped me through some things. Wow. Now, this could work as an admission that her earlier statement to Jet was in fact just her pride, her not wanting to admit that the boy she now despises could have helped her, but it's never built upon beyond this one line, which is a missed opportunity to, you know. There's no actual personality development here at all, like for anyone. It's, it's awful. Do some actual work. In the fifth episode, Katara single-handedly sends an entire squad of firebenders flying without impaling any of them because this is still a kid's show. And Aang, of course, notes <laughs> somehow. Nazi genocidal fucking Third Reich goddamn firebenders are in a kid's show. They should have gone one or two ways here. They could have made it, they could have changed it and made it an adult show and keep the gritty stuff. Or, 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 they should have actually just adapted it and its spirit. The reason why One Piece's adaptation worked is because the spirit of One Piece existed in this, even though the characters acted a little bit differently. The spirit of each character remained. And in this show, you are watching a facsimile of what Avatar is supposed to be, with the spirit of every single character completely squashed. That's how she is inventing new moves. That's the mark of a skilled bender. And then when we flash back to the day Katara's mother dies, Kaya tells her, Someday you will show the world just how powerful you are. Oh my you god, are. you're joking! It's literally every every conversation that she has! Is that the one aspect of her character that, you're tr that they just keep ha hammering home? Dude! And oh my goodness, can we please not? I mean, you are one iteration from literally just saying, I am woman, hear me roar. <laughs> she literally is. This is insane. She's just She-Hulk too. And look, Katara wanting to be a skilled waterbender and wanting to be able to fight to protect her home and her that's, friends that's is awesome. not a bad thing. But is... the thing is, the reason why she wanted to become a strong waterbender is because she wanted to protect people. She she loved Aang and wanted to protect Aang. She loved her brother and her family and she wanted to protect her home. She wanted to stop a war. The reason why she wanted to become a skilled waterbender was everything but selfishness. Okay, there were a couple of slight selfish things that showed up here and there, but that was the ultimate act of it. It is in fact a very good thing, but it cannot be everything. Aang's entire character arc is not just learning the three other elements so he can save the world. Obviously! It's also about freedom, maturity, responsibility, guilt, and the importance- Dude, that final scene where he doesn't want to need to kill the Fire Lord, and he goes on this whole weird, uh, trippy scene with the turtle, the lion turtle, like, that was such a powerful scene, where he didn't want to kill the Fire Lord and, and all that. Like, that's good shit. That's really good shit. 
acceptance of one's fastly held beliefs, and elements give his arc depth. This show understands that to a degree. It didn't do the best job with Aang, and much of what makes him a beloved character has been stripped away, but at least there is an attempt to have him work through his guilt and the weight of his duties separate from his training in the bending arts, yeah. which this yeah. season just doesn't include for some unfathomable reason. When the focus of a character is on her power, she becomes hardly a character at all. She's basically just a weapon. Team Avatar uses Katara. It's super effective. Literally, in, in their quest to make a badass female character, they have removed all of the character aspects to her and made her but a tool. How ironic, how ironic. They have objectified a woman when trying to set her free. Is that what we want from our heroines? That they're just swords to be wielded by the story to cut down bad guys? And yes, Simulation Katara is fighting the bad guys, is in fact on the right side, but her attention is so inward focused that it hardly matters. Remember how Katara just wanted the Earthbenders to rise up and fight, even if she could hardly bend a bubble at that time? True. Remember when Katara urged Aang to enter the sanctuary at Roku's temple, even though it meant sacrificing her freedom and maybe her life? Remember when Katara- True! She was always selfless. She was always out there compassionate, trying to help people. She was in it for the greater good of, of her people and of mankind. That's what That was always her goal. Making, ab making Aang the Avatar, making Aang powerful was her number one priority to help everyone because maybe Aang could save the world as she says in the intro. In this, her goal is always to become the hero. Tara defended Aang's honor in the storm only to find out that his story was more complex than she realized, but then encouraged him nonetheless, assuring Aang that it was meant to be, that if he had stayed, he would have been killed along with the rest of the Southern Air Temple. Side note, Netflix gave that line and a lot of Katara's relationship with Aang to Monk Gyatso. That, gave... That's why I like Monk Gyatso! It's crazy! It's crazy! Well, no wonder why I like Monk Gyatso. She needed further proof that they intentionally downplayed Katara and Aang's relationship. They knew Aang needed to be encouraged and consoled, but we couldn't have Captain Katara doing that because- Bro, bro. Because her caring about someone else? A woman caring? Well, not our women. Our women are badass machines of mass destructions, okay? They don't care. Because that would distract her from bending. All of that to say, Katara does a lot, a lot of important, noteworthy, impactful stuff without having to waterbend one drop. I ask you, what is a better example of strong, beautiful femininity? I mean, I'm very excited for uh, the Legend of Korra remake. It's going to be awesome. The only difference is they're not going to have Tenzin or uh, or any of Aang's grandchildren because K Katara don't want no children. She don't need no man. <laughs> Legend of Korra is just not going to have any Aang children. Airbenders are just going to be extinct. Because, <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> heroine who can throw some H2O around, or one who can motivate, inspire, and build up others while simultaneously learning how to become whole herself? The answer, of course, is someone who can do both. Yes, not Tara ostensibly wants to be able to bend to protect those who cannot protect themselves, but there's so little relationship building and God so damn. much me waterbender, you see, talk that any sense of self-gift or self-sacrifice gets drowned out. But let's talk about that both thing. Because yes, of right. course, the real Katara does in fact very much care about being able to waterbend. Yeah. She goes to- Dude, and in fact, she succeeds. It's like everything everything that the show is trying to do about making Katara badass to the point that they're sacrificing every other part of her character is something that she actually accomplishes in the cartoon. It's like, oh yeah, we have to sacrifice all of her hope, love, compassion, and, and personality for the sake of her just becoming a strong, badass female. When she was exactly that in the cartoon. Great links to acquire the waterbending scroll, which is a far more creative and interesting way to show how much Katara wants to learn waterbending than just having her tell us I'm a warrior and having Grandma Exposition tell her that she has always been a waterbender. No, they skipped the whole scroll stealing shit. She just kind of had it. No! So naturally, when Paku refuses to train Katara upon Team Avatar's arrival at the Northern Water Tribe, she is mildly perturbed, to say the least. However, you may recall, despite her frustrations with the North's stodgy customs and her personal irritation with Master Paku, Katara still wants Aang to train under him. Because ultimately, Katara's goal the whole time was Aang's success. It was saving the world that was her priority, not becoming Captain Marvel 3. 
This is naturally because she recognizes that there are far more important things at stake here than her own ability to master waterbending. The Avatar learning all four elements is the paramount mission of Team Avatar, and so she encourages Aang to learn from Baku, even if he is a big jerk. Once again, that element of the story is simply not present in the Netflix show. As mentioned, Aang doesn't waterbend, ever, and Buck 99 Katara only ever makes one half-hearted attempt to get him to try. So Netflix- That's crazy. That's actually insane. Book one water has no actual waterbending for Aang. That's insane. That's actually crazy. Paku isn't for Netflix Aang, he's for Netflix Katara, because everything in relation to her is for the purpose of getting her to waterbend. And the writers weren't satisfied with Paku merely upholding the tribe's customs, they had to make it personal. You're not strong enough. Women aren't strong enough, he tells her. Oh, god damn it. He wasn't even that bad in the actual thing! He just said women have a different duty, and their duty is healing. Which, I mean, obviously it's it's old-timey and backwards in its own way, but like, Master Paku is a massive asshole even, even in the cartoon Avatar, and I think that's fine. But like, you don't have to be that on the nose! Yeah, that's a stupid argument, and the original show doesn't have him make it for a reason. These are basically magical powers. Even an old coot like Paku would recognize that physical strength has very little to do with the actual ability to fight, especially since he is a master of waterbending, an art defined by using the strength of one's opponent against him. You could make True. all sorts of suggestions as to why the Northern Water Tribe only trains men to fight. You I mean, my guess is it's uh, it's like a tradition thing, right? It's like an old school tradition thing that the men fight and the women heal. That, that was always my interpretation of it, and it was based on some sort of cultural thing. Yeah, maybe it was it was a very old school, old timey, maybe slightly bigoted cultural thing, sure. But it was a cultural thing nonetheless. That's all cool. That's fine. Whatever. And um, but that all said and done, believing that men and women have different strengths, stuff like that. But just going on like a whole tirade of women are weak, and then she proves them wrong is like such a like. I feel like that's a plot that could have existed maybe ten years ago, and people wouldn't scoff at as much. You could suggest that men are naturally more aggressive or more naturally protective that keeping the women away from the front lines is an honorable thing to do, but whether you believe that or not isn't really relevant. Broad rules like- That is their culture, and they have their reasons, and that's whatever, that's what it is. Men fight, women heal can be generally helpful, but exceptions can and should be made when necessary. All benders, one might say, should have the freedom to do their duty. Katara's duty in both the original and the knockoff is to protect and train Aang. So yes, she is right. She should be allowed to train under Paku should be allowed to stand against the firebenders in combat. However, just because you're right about one thing doesn't sanctify all your other related arguments. Hoax Katara tells Sokka, All my life, I'd held myself back. Oh my god! Whoa! She doesn't use the held myself back line. Dude, Captain Marvel says the same thing. She has to hold herself back all of her time. Her entire character arc is really realizing that she can be herself and release her true power. Nail in the coffin. Nail in the coffin! And I'm not going to let someone else do it now. Which isn't true. No! She didn't hold herself back. She sucked at waterbending. She had no teacher. And she sucked. You could say that Grandma Exposition held her back by not giving her the waterbending scroll, but we have seen no evidence that Katara herself ever reigned in her bending. And of course that wasn't a plot line that existed in the an in the, uh, in the anime, in the cartoon, right? She stole the scroll from pirates. It's not like Grand Grand had the secret scroll to teach her shit and just never gave it to her. It's like every twist and turn in this that slightly deviates, it deviates in such a drastically negative fashion. See, One Piece live action, hot take, did some things better than the anime in that arc. They did, they improved certain aspects. Some of the changes that they made were good, okay? I think Garp's inclusion, I think Helmeppo's character, I think those were improved in the ad adaptation to One Piece from the original hot take. But I really think so. Buggy? Buggy was insanely, he was better as a character than the original. And an adaptation is never going to be able to just adapt the good parts of the story and not change anything. You're going to need to change some stuff. You're going to need to change some things. Some things have to change just because it's a different medium, right? And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. The fact that they, uh, they aged up some of the characters in the original One Piece, I think is totally fine. Like, but here, here every change is just so crazily negative. Bending abilities for any reason whatsoever. The first time we see her, she is practicing waterbending, and then she immediately proceeds to argue with Sokka about the value of said art. There is no reason to inject this line into Bruh. the story other than to paint Katara as a self-made, self-actualizing girl boss 
whose entire character arc revolves around her ability to do a thing. What a waste. Do the ha, thing, Katara! Still have her do the thing! Kaku. Am I objectifying correctly? This is what Netflix tells me to do. Do it, Katara! You are a perfect tool for my use! God, I wish everyone would treat women the way Netflix does. The world would be so much better, am I right? What will Netflix do? Will they actually let their Katara lose? Well, yes, it turns out the writers were smart enough to not change that element of the story, realizing that it would probably anger a lot of fans. Wait, they were... <laughs> well, obviously... <laughs> Julie, do the thing! <laughs> yeah, right. Even though they think we somehow wouldn't notice everything else they stripped away from her character. However, they altered the tone of the fight and its narrative impact significantly, all to suit Robot Katara's so-called character development. First, after losing, she asks Paku, but you still won't let me fight? And he affirms that. W wait, hold up. Fight. Not train. Fight. Not only is this contrary to the wow. narrative given by the original show, where Katara needed a master to train her, it contradicts this show, where Katara very clearly states her need and desire to train under the masters of the Northern Water Tribe. Crazy. And now she doesn't even want to train, now she just wants to fight. She even goes into detail about what aspects of her bending she thinks need improvement. But I guess we've forgotten about all that because Katara is enough for Katara. Second, of course, everyone just congratulates her for losing impressively, so it's basically like she didn't lose at all. Yeah, but you, it's true you may have lost the fight against an actual master that's the strongest guy ever, but that's still pretty awesome. We're such huge fans of you. Yeah, sure. Because we can't really have Katara lose. Third, remember how Paku, after having won the fight, sees Katara's necklace and recognizes it as the one he carved for his betrothed, no. a woman no. he loved, no. the one who left for the South Pole in no. rejection of the North. Shore. They don't cut this out. There's no way. Rigid customs. Remember how recalling that painful memory caused him to recognize that his inflexible ways should bend a little, and so he agrees to train Katara no. along with Aang. No. Yeah. No. That's not here either. You're kidding me! You're joking! Wait. <laughs> It's not like they just don't give character development to Katara. They don't give character development to Paku. They don't give character development to anybody. They don't make uh, Sanka a sexist in the beginning so that he can grow from it. They, there is no character development of a single character this entire show. Just let the Fire Nation invade and be done with it. Okay, well, why not? Can we have like a twist where the Fire Nation wins? Easy. If Paku came to that realization about their customs through the memory of his past lost love, that would mean that Katara wasn't the one to change his mind. Fuck off. There's no way. There's no way that was the mindset. They specifically want to make it a girl boss moment. They changed the story. They broke character relationships. They annihilated Paku's character completely just to make her a bigger girl boss. And they needed Katara to be the one to change his mind. And so on the very brink of battle, Katara goes to even the odds and then approaches Master Paku stating, you know we can make a difference. And by we, she of course means all the women of the tribe. That's right, Katara has brought to the front line of battle dozens of women whose have no training, have literally no training. The ability, waterbending-wise, is healing. They annihilated every single character in this arc for a girl boss moment. Holy shit. This is like the, the, the most brain rot thing I've ever seen in my life. Bro, she has a whole woman rise up moment. She turns it into an entire misogynistic society shit. Oh my fucking god, dude. I, I'm literally fuming. Her epic speech to galvanize the earthbenders was switched to here and, and just like, oh my lord, I'm literally furious. I, I, I can't believe it. I'm so happy I didn't finish the show. I don't need to go into detail as to why this is a terrible plan, right? We all understand that these women are going to be massacred because they have absolutely no idea what to do. Unless, of course, they've all just been practicing in secret all these years, or Katara gave a brief PowerPoint presentation based off her scroll that conveniently enabled all the women to instantly learn the martial arts side of waterbending. But who cares about logical consistency? This is about Katara proving to the big bad man that girls can fight too. Nothing shall stand- Wow, you're so right. I didn't think of this. Women can fight. I will train you! In her way. Again, Katara is right and Paku is wrong. This is established in the original show. But while that story handled the resolution of this conflict with some tact, and added Bro, depth to Paku. I, I hate this. I'm so upset. I am literally so upset. Character. And you wonder why the uh, the cartoon writers left when they heard what they were doing with this. They, they decided, yeah, we're not going to be part of this live action adaptation. In the meanwhile, the adaptation just has Katara beat him over the head. And Very excited for uh, the next arc, the, the Alabasta arc, and the next live action One Piece, where Nami and Vivi give empowering speeches to the oppressed women of Alabasta to fight back against Baroque works. It's going to be awesome. I'm very excited for that. That's going to be great. Thank God One Piece is doing right. 
but like, what the fuck, man? What is this? What is this? Because real women are natural fighters who could murder anyone with a single swing. True. Till he yields. No surprise there. The show is ham-fisted and heavy ham. They are butt-blasting my show. They are butt-blasting one of my favorite IPs of all time to cram some sort of message. ...it in practically all its storytelling. Would you like proof? Surely you don't need more, but in the spirit of uh -huh. ham-fistedness, I'm giving you more. Remember the iconic line of Zuko's, you little peasant. You've found him, or haven't you? Dude, I love how he, he writes the quotes in the Avatar font for, every, for the Avatar, and then he writes in, like, basic Comic Sans bullshit for the quotes for the... That's just a nice artistic take, Mr. Sam, Master Samwise. Well, to my unironic delight, that line finds its way into the adaptation. But of course, Paku didn't actually train Simulacrum Katara. He just let her fight. So, what will Katara say to Zuko's inquiry? I did- I DON'T NEED NO MASTER! You're looking at her. <laughs> I'm gonna cry, bro. What the frick is going on? I physically face palmed. Seven years dungeon, no lawyers, no trial. They killed it. They killed it. I, I take it back. It wasn't. A, it's not a four out of ten. It, it's a, it's a solid two. What the fuck is this soulless husk show supposed to be? I I I despise. I despise when you take characters and in order to promote some sort of message, you, you twist and contort and destroy them. Dude, Lobotomy Kaisen was better than this. Dude, taking a character, taking a female character and just making her awesome and perfect and badass and everything she does is amazing and not need any help from anybody is not empowering women. Because newsflash, women, just like men, need to work on themselves to become better people and do often need help from outside forces. And sometimes their struggles are not always gonna be, I should have believed in myself more. Bro, they, they took they took Avatar and they just they just shot it right in front of us. In before they pull some uh, Pokemon water beats fire bullshit and Katara beats the Fire Lord at the end. What the hell is this? I, I am like visually perturbed. I am sickly. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I rest my case. It's Jover. Netflix Katara is a waterbender. That's it. She is. That is her entire character. Oh, there are the occasions. See, the penis in the waterbending is a metaphor for, uh, for, for how bad the show is. Oh, you see, the tentacle hentai looking thing is a metaphor for how badly Netflix raped Avatar to turn it into this mongrel. Occasional lines tossed in there to try and give her something else. Like at the end of the season when she tells Avatar Rage Monster Aang, I need you. But those moments just serve to remind us of how underdeveloped her character has been throughout the show. Does she need Aang? Why? Sure, in the first episode, she proclaimed that the Avatar is hope, and she needs hope, but- The Avatar is hope. Let them all believe in the Avatar and hope for the Avatar to save the day so that their morale is not bad. And then I will actually save the day. <laughs> Where has that been for the past six plus hours of runtime? The sentiment wasn't built upon in the slightest. Katara spends the majority of most episodes away from Aang. She's with Jet outside Omashu, with Sokka in the Cave of Two Lovers, by herself in the spirit world, not in masks at all, and mostly with Paku at the North Pole. And the scenes they do have together, they're mostly just in them together. They have one or two oh, lip service God, bonding it, scenes bro. that do very little to actually establish their relationship, and practically nothing to suggest that Katara needed Aang for anything more than jump-starting her waterbending battery. This moment isn't a bad one in a vacuum. Katara should need Aang, and Aang should respond to Katara's need for him. The problem is, this moment doesn't. Dude, what is going on? I'm like, I don't understand. I'm so sad, bro. It's so sad. Just so exist in a vacuum. It occurs within the context of a show that has done next to nothing to develop the relationship the writers now want you to believe exists. Because they recognize just how important that relationship is for the narrative. Yeah, so but I think that they're just uh, relying on the fact that uh, people just believe People already know the world building from the cartoon avatar. People already know the relationships from the cartoon avatar. And now they're just gonna be like, okay, so you know all that. Now look at our new Captain Marvel. Despite the fact that they've ignored it entirely for 95% of the show. At its core, femininity is relational. That's not to say that masculinity isn't, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. This is because the virtues necessary for true, genuine femininity enable one to relate properly to others. Katara displays many such virtues, some established, some still developing throughout the original show. Compassion, perseverance, selflessness, patience, understanding, and hopefulness are all core parts of who Katara is. And they're butchered, absolutely. They give her character depth. They make her feel real. Netflix Katara feels like a cookie-cutter girl boss from 2019. She has been stripped of those virtues that defined her. 
save for a mild sprinkling here and there, and left only with her skill and combat ability as her defining character traits, it's the crazy. attainment of said skill as her only character growth, and the realization that she is her own master as the fulfillment of her character arc. Actually, viscerally in pain. Her character arc was recognizing that she don't need no man. Does that sound cringe to you? She finally realized she don't need no man. Oh my god, dude. What a waste. First of all, Master Samwise, great video. Thank you for sitting through this uh, show that so I didn't have to. Uh, definitely go check out Master Samwise. He'll be in the description of the YouTube video. Yeah, I don't know. Man. I, I love getting canceled for talking about female characters, but I think the fact that people like when I make those videos just goes to show that shut the fuck up. You can cancel me if you want. I'm going to keep saying whatever the hell I want because that's what I do for a living. <laughs> and I really like it. <laughs> I really like it. But dude. That was abysmal. Oh my god. Humiliatingly bad. Alright, anyway, moving on to the next thing. Uh, there is no Megamind 2, there is no Queen of England, and there is no Netflix Avatar. Stay weird, man. Like, subscribe, and this video was streamed live on kick.com slash See you there. Stay weird, fam.